Welcome everyone to First Unitarian Church of Honolulu's Tuesday night Pauhana. My name is TJ Fitzgerald. I'm the minister of First Unitarian. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And this is our weekly time to be together to talk about some of the issues facing these islands, facing one another, uh, facing this community. And we're very excited. Oh, someone's got full. I'm going to mute. Yeah, I think we did it. All right. Uh, and this is, we're very excited to have with us today a uh, member of the church, but also wearing another hat today, if there is such a hat that can fit on his marvelous head. Uh, uh, our member, Matt Geyer, who is also the head of the uh, Faith Action Environmental Justice Task Force. Welcome, Matt. Hi, folks. Yeah, uh, yeah I guess my head's pretty big. Is, is that what you're trying to say there? No, oh, just your hair, just your hair, buddy. Uh, I'm just jealous, you know, full, full on jealousy. Uh, but, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, this is something, you know, I mean, I will say I've been in other UU communities where, um, you know, environmental justice is a big, uh, topic that's on, you know, community for earth, you know, is a big part of, uh, the UU, uh, world and at the Portland church where I serve, they were a very large, uh, very, very active group. Uh, and so it's, it's wonderful to, I've felt some more discussions about around that happening here at the church lately. And uh, so hearing from you as a member, but also in your hat as one of our main justice partners and a leader of their task forces, uh, we're really looking forward to this. So thanks for being here. Um, so what I always ask people first is tell us who you are and what is it that you do? So again, Matt Geyer, I'm the chair of the Environmental Justice Task Force for Faith Action for Community Equity, of which we're a member. And uh, I've been the chair since it was founded. The task force was founded uh, just over a year ago. And right after it was founded, of course, we went into COVID. Uh, but it was, uh, it turned out to be a really great way to grow uh, with being able to start up meetings at any time. And we really took advantage of that. And we've been growing and doing a lot of different things. But personally, I'm, I've lived in Oahu for 16 years. And I uh, currently live in Manoa, way in the back of the valley. I have two kids. My partner has three kids. And depending on the day of the week, we have between zero and five of them at the household. So it's never boring here. Yeah. That sounds great. Well, wonderful. Um, yeah. So what brought you to the environmental justice task force a year ago? Were you involved with Faith Action before or what happened? No, I wasn't involved. So I was uh, looking around uh, prior to that at different ways I could make an impact. And one of the ways I really felt that there was a lack was in public communication of these issues. And it's, you know, you, you get a scientist who comes up there and says, we have 34 gigatons of CO2 in the air, right? But nobody knows what a gigaton is. Or they say there's 100 million barrels of oil every day, but nobody really knows what a barrel is either for the most part. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of communication gaps there. And I, I felt like there could be a use for speaking, especially after my own experience uh, testifying at city council. And you know, my first time testifying, I walk up there and I, I just nervously read something from my iPhone and thank you very much and, and walk back down. And I was like, this, that, that didn't feel effective. I, I looked up as I was finishing my remarks and I, I saw boredom. You know, because that's exactly what everybody else was doing. I was like, this, there's got to be a way. So I uh, ended like up my nightmare. I literally uh, have nightmares about I'm talking and looking out at the whole group of people look terribly bored. So I'm with you. I feel you. Right. Yeah. And it was kind of a nightmare. So I, I determined I was going to do something about it. I, I decided to join Toastmasters because that was cheaper than going to a, uh, you know, full on speaking class. At like 45 bucks for six months or whatever. Um, so I joined that and I started practicing giving environmental speeches and I kept doing it over and over. 
until I kind of became the running joke. And I'm still the running joke of my Toastmasters club where, oh, here comes Matt. He's going to talk about the environment. Um, and at um, one of the meetings, I met uh, Susan or Sue Shake, um, who was a assistant director at Faith Action. And she recruited me um, after, you know, we had been in the club for a while. She recruited me as the chair. So um, that's how that happened. Great. Great. Um, now, had you been, we're not going to do a member rundown, but have you been affiliated with First Unitarian before? I, um, I attended this church uh, off and on over probably five years here and there. Um, and uh, I was raised Lutheran and I've been off and on attending various churches. I attended uh, the Methodist church a little bit in Kailua for a while, uh, kind of bouncing around. And um, yeah, I, I really felt though that this community was the one that that matched me best and I, I felt most at home here. So I decided to become a member recently. Great, there's lots of, uh, lots of shakas and, and thumbs going up. I don't know if you can see that. So, um, but uh, yeah, well, that's wonderful. So uh, I know that in, uh, you've, you've uh, I can't, I, I'm tempted now after saying you're giving all these environmental speeches, I feel like we wanna hear some of them because you are right about messaging. I, like I said, even on the island, I, I just don't hear a lot of this discussion put in ways that is uh, understandable or even frequent. Um, and climate change is bringing people here. Uh, it is forcing people from parts of the island. It's doing all those things. So do you have, a, do you wanna give us a, one of these talks, help us understand? I mean, you know, we got, you know, a little time here. Can you give us a, one of your uh, one of your best give us your best sixteen bars. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, well, let's see a random a random speech. Uh, well, I, I could tell you my origin story a little bit more um, because that'll this will be my confession too. This is a right. This is a good group to confess my sins. Um, I hope. Uh, so we don't believe in sin, so it's a perfect. Yeah, there perfect. you go. <laughs> it's, it's uh, so I, I, my environmental journey, I, I used to actually invest in uh, oil, oil companies. Um, and for example, I uh, invested in British Petroleum right after the, they had that huge disaster in the Gulf because I was so in tune with the oil industry at the time that I knew that, you know, even the world's biggest disaster wouldn't impact them as much as their stock price went down. Um, and so that's my confession. You can you can boo and hiss and um, uh, and I'll appreciate it because I, I regret those and I that's that's one of the things that motivates me to you know remember that I, I have some uh, history that I need to make up for or, or something like that. Um, but one day I was trying to just imagine all the the oil that was being used every day and 100 million barrels is, uh, there's 42 gallons in a barrel. And I was trying to just figure out that's 4.2 billion gallons. Um, but it, you, again, you can't picture that. It's just too big of a number. So I tried different ways and I, I came upon putting it in swimming pools. Um, so if you took the 4.2 billion gallons and you filled it into your standard size back, backyard in-ground swimming pool, there would be a line a thousand miles long every single day, which to me, that's like, how can you argue that that amount of oil going into our environment every day does not have an impact, right? If I were to reach into one of those pools and get a handful of that oil and, and light it on fire, um, it would be a really terrible idea. Uh, but also, you'd have it would clear a building. This the amount of smoke it would generate. So it's, and that's just one part of it. That's the oil. the The natural gas and the coal is two thirds of the problem, and the oil is one third of the problem. So 
it when I when I realized that how much oil and I could visualize it and that that visual really worked for me, um, then I, I I just knew this is a problem and this is something that we need to tackle, and we need to tackle it really soon. If, if you listen to the science and we. A lot of times we, we don't want to listen to the science. And I think that is because of the fear. There's so much fear around this issue. Um, and a lot of that fear is justified, right? We're talking about the end of the world, uh, potentially, um, at least as far as humanity is concerned, or at the very least, significant impacts, especially to already uh, disadvantaged communities. So that's uh, that's really what what gets me motivated is how do we how do we tackle the fear? I guess is is one of the main issues I think that we have. How do we get around that fear? Which the fear is paralyzing us. The fear is you know we're we're worried it's too late. We're worried that our impact is going to be insignificant. We're, we're worried that uh, we're going to do the wrong thing. And when you're fearful, it, like all social justice issues, when you're afraid of something, if you're afraid of a, a houseless person on the street because they seem big and scary, you're less likely to help them out. Um, if you're afraid of climate change, you're going to go inward. It, it, that fear is causing a narcissistic type behavior where we only care about ourselves, our own families, and we, we just go inward instead of uh, outward. So uh, the, the big struggle we face right now is conquering that fear and being brave enough to accept that we have this issue and move forward on it. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, I think framing it in something like fear and overcoming fear as a, uh, is, is powerful, is more useful. Um, but there are still these narratives. Uh, can I talk about some of them with you? Like one being, uh, well, you know, this is all just kind of virtue signaling stuff because corporations are really doing 99.9% .9 of the polluting and oil use. Like, me and my one car, it's not really doing that much of a thing. And, and I think that it's mostly just giving us something to do. We're just like playing the, you know, playing the violin as the Titanic is going down on the deck of the Titanic. Uh, sorry to be so, you know, uh, descriptive, but there, <laughs> I, I hear that all the time from people my age. And what, what would, what would you say to someone who's saying that? Well, often I get the question, right? What, what can I do, right? What, what can little old insignificant me do for the environment? Um, and you heard it here first from Matt, the environmentalist. There is nothing you can do to help the environment, to help stop the climate crisis. And in fact, there's a whole lot of nothing you can do. So what is he talking about now? Let me see if I can. Uh, oh, we're gonna get a presentation. I share like Share something here. Well, not a presentation, but remember when we first went into the pandemic, right? Our, everybody stayed at home and what happened? Yep. You remember seeing pictures of this? Like, like these kind of pictures? Yep. In the background? Absolutely. What happened was we were doing a lot of nothing. And it's really the most powerful message you can send to the world and to corporations that you know what? I mean, we can't, you know, this is a way to just grab your attention and say, we need to do nothing. And uh, I, I use this excuse when my partner comes in the living room and I'm lying on the couch and she's like, what are you doing? 
There's dishes and things. I'm like, babe, I'm saving the environment. <laughs> but I'm uh, sure you're very popular with that response. Yeah, not so much. Yeah. Uh, I, we'll talk, we'll talk offline about how things are going at home. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that doesn't go over too well. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, but yeah, the number one thing you can do is a little bit less than what we've been doing for travel less. Uh, waste less food, um, take with regard. And there's a, there's a great uh, spiritual slash uh, environmental group that I participate in every week. Um, I can give you guys the link if you guys are interested. It's run by this guy, Gary Hoover. And we talk about, um, he's, he's, pretty much a, a solid Christian guy. So everything is based on the Bible for him, but there's, there's a lot of really powerful messages that he's able to extract from the scriptures there. And so like in Genesis where we are, we're given this garden of Eden and we have been given rules and we've been given expectations. And I, I guess I misspoke. We, we haven't been given this Garden of Eden. This Garden of Eden has been made for us. So that, there's a key distinction there, and I, I screwed it up. Um, but that's an important point. It's been made for us. It hasn't been given to us. Um, if we don't follow the rules, we will be evicted like a bad tenant. And that's a very powerful, you know, there's, there's even these cycles going through biblical stuff where there's, there's a, a period of time where people are kind of okay, and then period of time where they're getting out of control, and then God comes in and uh, smites them or sets them right. Um, the Deuteronomic, yeah, something cycles, but... Uh, Deuteronomic revisions. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, and it's just a, a really powerful way to think that this earth is not ours, we weren't giving it, given it, like I misspoke earlier, but it's more like we're tenants and we need to be responsible for this because it doesn't belong to us. And that, that whole concept of the earth not belonging to us, but more like we belong to the earth and it's a part of who we are is really powerful to me as far as um, structuring my thinking and my actions and what I do moving forward. So I think I wandered from the original question quite a bit. <laughs> good. That's good. Cause what it brought me to was, um, is that even pastorally to those here living one's life in a way of that much consciousness or that much awareness of what one is doing and how their actions connect to their values is deeply healing and powerful. Um, it's a, it's, it has effects beyond simply the environment or things like that. It, leading a life that's that conscious of what one's doing, no matter what it is that, that is one's, I mean, ask someone in the military or ask someone who's a, a trained um, fighter or something like that, having something that dictates so many of their actions um, has benefits. Uh, and if it's something you really believe in, um, sort of philosophically and practically, like caring for the earth, where we're tenants, it can have more than just an effect on the benefit of the earth It has an effect on you. Uh, or I believe it has an effect on on one's, you know, sort of being one's psyche, one's psychology. Have you found that? I mean, you went through a big change. Now, we've, we've said this before, you know, among my clients were the Koch brothers. So I just, I want you to know that I'm, I'm with you. Uh, I've, I've done some stuff I'm not proud of myself. Uh, I don't know which one of us has more years of atonement to make, but, um, but tell me a little bit about, I mean, has it made a difference for you spiritually or however you describe what goes on for you internally making those choices and living in this way? Yeah, it, it does actually. And just the overall experience of just taking on this challenge of saying, I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna do whatever it takes to, to make a difference in climate change. Um, 
just deciding to take on that challenge has really been revolutionary for me personally um, for so many ways. I mean, just having a purpose is good in general, as we all know. But I think, like you said, it, it forces you to stop and reflect on your own actions every day. And in doing so, you, you live a more woke life, right? But there's, there's, there's even more benefits that are, that are just kind of incidental, but they're fantastic is that you, you get to go to all these meetings with really fantastic people who are also working on these problems from all different walks of life and have fantastic conversations. And, you know, we're laughing, we're crying, we're, we're sharing everything. And that part of it, um, you know, I, I've met so many people over Zoom that I haven't met in real life, and I'm really looking forward to meeting them in person at some point. And, um, and sometimes I feel a little guilty over how much fun I'm having fighting this crisis. Um, but at the same time, it's important to do that because I know this is going to be a long-term thing. This isn't something we're going to fight for six months, a year, two years, and win. It's going to take persistence and to have that that longevity to stay in the fight for that long you need to be able to enjoy it as as best you can yeah there there are other benefits too so i i keep a, a vegan diet and i went to cheesecake factory the other day and that the menu at cheesecake factory is about this thick and there's one thing on it that i can eat so while everyone else was going through this menu and, and there was a baby and I got to keep the baby because they, no, they wouldn't really give me the baby. The father kept the baby, but uh, they are trying to like figure out what they want to eat. It took like 15 minutes. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm having the one thing I can get on the menu. In most places, there's only a few things I can get on the menu. Now I'm being selfish. There are other reasons. Um, I'll just tell a quick story. I was at a, an environmental event once and uh, there was someone there who's really against fossil fuels and just felt that this was the only way to, to combat um, climate change. And I said, well, I mean, if everyone changed their diet to a vegan diet, I mean, it, it'd go a lot faster, you know, and, and arguably it's, it's actually more effective. She, she looked at me like I was crazy. Uh, and this is someone who's in the fight, like she's committed. You know, but the idea of giving up her diet or somehow being on the table and her acknowledging that it would have any benefit was off the table. Uh, and she almost disinvited me from the thing I was being asked to preside, for, to preside at. Uh, so can you say something first about, is it that effective? Like where's, where's like the vegan world uh, in this and, and how, uh, well, let's start with that. Can you say something about diet and food choice? Yeah, absolutely. So I just finished a documentary, a pretty great one, called Takeout. And it shows that there is a direct link between consuming beef and destruction of the Amazon. So every time we choose to have some beef, we're also choosing to lose a little bit more rainforest. And if you, one of, the, one of the problems is, I think, is that we've been hearing about rainforest destruction forever, right? That's been, since I was a little kid, I, I remember hearing about rainforest destruction. We, we need to save the rainforest. And it's gotten so much worse that it's worth taking a fresh look to see how much damage has been done and how much is still going on and what's the current state of things because it's the problem has accelerated and it's at a time when we need it to be going the other direction and that's really scary um, but that's just the facts um, so yeah uh, the the more, and, and you don't want to, once again, like you said, choosing a meat-free diet is a really big problem for a lot of people. So I would recommend people try just reducing 
and not wasting, um, especially start with mammals. And um, if, if your concern is for the environment, um, reduce mammals first and then um, yeah, fish and chicken. Obviously, if you've watched Sea Spiracy, I haven't seen it yet, but I've, I've heard it and I've heard a lot about it. And, it's, uh, and I've read a lot about those issues over the years. Um, there's definitely a lot of problems in the fishing industry as well as how chickens were raised because I've personally seen um, factory chicken farms up close and it's quite disgusting. Uh, but environmentally, it's, it's extremely damaging as well. But most of all, the beef, the lamb. Um, now, they, they will, there will be arguers that say, well, there's, there's, um, there's ways you can do it where it will actually benefit the environment. And I believe that that is true. There are ways to raise cattle um, that would benefit the environment by um, sequestering CO2 in the soil. And there's their hooves break up the soil and, and all these good things. If, um, if beef is raised in a natural environment, cows are raised in a natural environment and they're allowed to graze, um, they're not fed a lot of um, extra grains and things. And the beef is then sold locally. It's not shipped in refrigerated trailers halfway across the world. In that case, then I would say, yes, there's, there are some cases where meat can be um, environmentally friendly, but the vast majority of our meat, our beef especially, is, um, is unsustainable and it's, it's highly damaging to the environment. We'll let you say it, so I don't have to say it. That's good. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but the other thing that kind of came up in my story is the conflict sometimes in messaging. I think there's some fear among folks in the environmental community to, to say unpopular things. They're afraid to, to take a side that is going to be unpopular when there are other, other ways that are more popular. Uh, as far as uh, saying something like, you should stop eating your, your steaks versus you should be moving toward more uh, fuel efficient cars. Like there's some, do you ever, I mean, maybe in this time has passed, maybe now it's just, everyone's just got to be in it together. Or otherwise we're not getting anywhere. Or are you still experiencing some differences of opinion in how messaging has to happen in order for it to get out at all? Like, is there anything like that? Like we're so glum and we're so dim like no one's going to want to ever listen to us. We need to like do this. We need to message this way. Um, that was what I was picking up from our conversation, not yours and mine, mine and hers. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. It's a, a very common problem, right? If, if you watch enough environmental documentaries, you will just want to sit on your couch and do absolutely nothing because you won't want to eat anything. You won't want to <laughs> go anywhere. Um, you won't want to buy anything. Uh, so there's always, I, I, I just say we need to all do better and we need to think of our actions and our purchases as for the most part, in a way we are stealing from the future. Um, so we need to find a way to both reduce our, our use of things, our travel, our purchases, um, reduce as well as finding a way to give back. So make sure that we're not in debt to the next generation. The next generation, I mean, you're, you're recording this, right? The next generation is gonna be able to go back and look at all of our stuff that we're all recording right now and they're going to be able to say, who, who did what when they had a chance? Where, 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 did, where did you stand when they still had a chance to do something? And we have all the facts. We have all the solutions. So it's for the, for the rest of history, where you stood on this issue will be... Um, will be known. And so it's important, 
that, that kind of goes into the, the negative aspect of it, but in a way like, there's- No, that's good. Bring the fire, my friend, bring it. <laughs> <laughs> there's positive too, you know? I mean, again, I was saying I, I have so much fun um, pursuing this environmental justice and it's so exciting. There's, there's everything, you know, we've got drama, we've got, um, it's like I'm in a sitcom sometimes. We've got dirty money, politics, you know, the whole gambit, you know, environmental organizations who don't seem to be environmental after all. And, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it can be really, it can either be really frustrating and, and or you just got to sit back and just kind of say, well, this is interesting times. <laughs> so, and, yeah, so speaking of, you know, being on the front line or, or taking a stand, you, you chose to join with uh, Faith Action and someone is as informed as you are and uh, with as much penance to pay, uh, that speaks volumes to me. Can you, can you tell me why Faith Action uh, first? And then we're gonna talk about some other stuff around the island, but. Well, I, I didn't really know a whole lot about Faith Action when I joined. Um, I just said, hey, there's this new environmental group. They need a, they need a chair, let's try it out. Um, and that's, that's kind of going back to your saying earlier where we're, we're worried about what, whether we're doing the right thing. We kind of need people, more people to just be brave and go out there and do something, you know? We need action. And I like the title of Faith Action. And they have a good history where they've been fighting for uh, minimum wage, they've been fighting for affordable housing. And so I'm, I'm like, I'm down for all those things. Um, in my history, my father uh, worked at the uh, original Habitat for Humanity and helping um, that while that was starting up with Richard Fuller. And um, he worked with them for many years and um, we've, we've been fighting the uh, racial justice fight as well. Um, uh, my whole life, I, I was surrounded by that. And uh, so he's like, why are you going into environment? <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a challenge. Like, what do we do? Um, how do we best approach this problem? And I think Chip Fletcher uh, said it best to get people motivated, people need to realize that we don't got this um, in the environmental movement. We need some action. And that's, you know, faith actions, like let's, let's do some policy work and, and get some real change here. We need massive change. We need a lot more people speaking out at the legislature, at the city council, we need a lot more rallies. There, there has to be a huge movement because our current politicians are not getting it done. And really, you know, we say, let's, let's try to elect the right people in there. I, I feel it's more important that we make whoever's in office right now get what needs to be done done by just sending them emails and calling and testifying. Uh, you know, this last legislative session, it was, you know, a lot of the times it's me and the same half dozen guys and gals uh, testifying over and over and we'd see each other and wave and, um, and then we'd be in meetings together and various things after, but there needs to be so much more. We don't, if it keeps going at this rate and it, it's increasing slowly, I see a, a, a movement building, but it needs to grow so much more and so much faster if we're going to make these enormous changes we need to do to make an impact on climate change. So I, I have follow-up questions, but I, I keep coming back to my sense that there just aren't that many groups working on this in this state. I mean, is that true? I just, you can't, you can't get through downtown Portland on any day <laughs> without seeing a, some kind of action. And I, I so rarely see it here. It, what what's up with that? Have you done any thought on that or um, yeah, what's going on? Um, yeah, I, I think we need more. I'm hopeful that there is some growth there. Um, there are there are quite a few organizations out there actually, but I'm 
I'm, I'm hopeful that they're going to start being more active as more people join them. And I'm encouraging people not just to, you know, I, of course, I'd love to see you at the faith action meetings, which you're all welcome to join uh, Wednesdays or Thursdays now at five. And then we have a working meeting on Monday. So we meet every week, twice a week, and we're really going to town on stuff. But there's a, there is a lot of great organizations out there that you can join. Um, Surf Rider um, is a great one if you like cleaning beaches and there's um, sustainable coastlines and uh, there's, there's, there's bunches out there, but I agree it's, it's not where it should be. And the primary reason, once again, I think is the fear. Um, going back to what I said earlier is the fear is causing paralysis or the fear is causing people to go inward and, and only care for themselves or um, and the fear just just causes uh, people to not know not feel confident in what they're doing like well if I buy such and such it's good but I'm, I'm still supporting this or that um, there's so many hard decisions to make in life um, and how, how do you do that in an environmentally friendly way is takes a lot of thought process to figure that out. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that's one of my goals is to help build up both Faith Action's Environmental Justice Task Force as well as other organizations around the island. So we do have a, uh, a movie screening on Earth Day coming up as well as, um, and that's just for faith action, but um, anyone's welcome. Uh, so we tell us more have, about that. I well, just... we, well, even better than that, that's just a boring old movie screening with, with discussions and stuff like that. Who wants to go to one of those? This um, one really likes their movie screening, <laughs> I'm just telling you. Yeah, so that, that one is the, um, we're gonna screen the film 2020 Climate Disasters. So it, it kind of, especially in Hawaii, um, you might not have been following all the disasters that happened last year because we're so worried about the coronavirus and everything's corona, corona, corona. But in reality, we had five huge hurricanes hit in the Texas Gulf area, right? And that's unprecedented. They were terrible hurricanes and they did massive amounts of damage. Um, and it kind of just at least in Hawaii, it, it, it wasn't that like it was staying in the news that long, even though there was horrendous disasters with fires, um, unprecedented fires in California. All these disasters were happening and it didn't feel like it got as much attention as it had in previous years because of the coronavirus. So we're gonna watch this film, which goes through a lot of those uh, disasters as they were happening and um, reflect on that and um, hopefully not reflect too much on how fearful that makes us because I'm trying to avoid that and build up that positive energy. So um, our second event is going to be um, Chip Fletcher again, the uh, famous climate scientist of Hawaii is going to be giving a webinar um, and us and about a dozen other environmental groups are going to be there. That's really exciting. We've got all these partners together. Um, and I'll be hosting along with when is, the... When is that? That is May 8th. Um, and you will get the opportunity to both listen to Chip Fletcher talk for a good 45 minutes and then ask him questions. And then we will um, divide up. You can uh, you can hear about what each of the groups um, is doing on uh, local groups is doing on island, and then they will have breakout rooms for each of those groups. So you can pick a group that you'd like to learn more about, and join that uh, breakout room with them, and and have a little talk with them to see uh, if you're interested in joining them. Great. I was going to ask, what's what's Faith Action? What are your priorities in the next coming few months? Or is there something left in the legislature you're trying to get done? Or uh, what are your what are the priorities in the coming months? Well, the 
legislature session was well, legislative session was pretty good. Um, the bill that we wanted for carbon cash back did not get through, um, but a, a fair amount of other environmentally um, friendly bills, I guess, will are still alive. And so we're still trying to do our best to support those and working with all these um, other organizations to try and um, see these bills through and make sure they don't get uh, gutted or changed for the worse. Um, but if I could share my screen here, I would like to show you what um, we're going to be working on. We're going to start this um, again for next session because this this idea, I think I presented it to some people here probably, but I'm going to present it again because it just takes five minutes. So that's all right. Sure, go for it. All right. So sometimes I do this backwards. All right. You see that? Yep. You good? You got all it. Right. So this is. We started this uh, late last year, and we did end up getting a bill into the legislature this year. But again, um, it didn't. It died um, pretty quickly, and that's that's something in Hawaii and probably most places that happens is that the first year you introduce something to the legislature, they kind of take a look at it and then they go, "Yeah, how about next year?" Um, but we are really going to push this idea for next session and I will get into why at the end but I'd like to break up the monotony a little bit and show you a video that was created by the son of one of our members so let's see here dealing with climate change is urgent and everyone has a role to play putting a fee on fossil fuels is a highly effective solution renewable energy becomes more competitive and people are encouraged to use less fossil fuels. But how can we do that without increasing financial burden on residents of Hawaii? Hawaii could collect a fee on fossil fuel. The money would then be returned to everyone. You can use the money any way you want. The money could be used to offset any increase in prices. Or if you reduce your use by riding a bike, carpooling, taking the bus, or lots of other ways, you keep more of your money. You are in control of how much money you want to keep. This type of program is called carbon fee and dividends, and Faith Action feels this is the most equitable way to reduce the use of fossil fuels. We want a livable world, and we can make the changes needed to bring climate change under control. Yeah. Yeah, that. That thing. So yeah. um, we... Uh, we got that created by, uh, again, a son of uh, one of our members, and we were hopeful that he would be able to make us some more videos, and then he got hired by Nickelodeon, and now he's too busy. So there's that. Well, good we for looking... him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. Um... I used to do some work for them, too, so. Nice. <laughs> so we, uh, we are looking at making more kind of um, building awareness of environmental issues, of this issue in particular, um, as well as uh, I think our next video, we want to really make, uh, bring an awareness to that the people, you know, a lot of the environmental groups are like, yeah, we need to go after the youth and the youth are the future. Um, well, we've got 10 years, right, to fix climate change depending on who you ask, maybe less, maybe more. Um, and I kind of have a feeling that our legislature is not going to look that much different 10 years from now than it looks now. I, I feel like it's going to be people my age, 44 or older, right? Um, and so there needs to be a, also a movement to communicate to that age group. Um, and I don't know if uh, posting a lot of stuff to Instagram might be the, the correct way of doing that. <laughs> but anyways, I'm off topic. Let me talk about carbon cashback a little bit. So once again, we got, we got a big problem, climate change. Um, we've got an economic crisis. Um, and we've got this solution, carbon cashback. So 
essentially we're going to send out a check to all Hawaii residents and exactly like the stimulus check we all received, um, except that the money comes from the fossil fuel companies. So that will end up rewarding people, giving them a financial incentive to make more sustainable choices. And just like the stimulus check, it should stimulate the economy. Um, and, and just like the stimulus check as well, another question people don't really think about a lot, I think, is that uh, where does the money from the stimulus check come from, right? And if you think about it, it's got to either come from our taxes or we're going to build up more debt. And debt is a, another form of taxation because we got to pay it off eventually. So it's going to come from taxes and our taxes are disproportionately the wealthiest of our nation pay the majority of the taxes. And that's just, just the way our tax system works. Um, our tax system is still regressive, but that's for another story. Um, so this is gonna be very similar to the stimulus check because uh, the tax is applied on fossil fuels and fossil fuels, as it turns out, the wealthiest residents are the ones using the most fossil fuels. Um, so looking at this slide here, we all know this. Climate change is accelerating. Um, obviously, we're an island state. We're going to be severely impacted. And, but we are the most petroleum-dependent state. Um, and that's really critical for Hawaii, that we got to tackle this petroleum problem. So A lot of cars on this island. Yeah. Yeah. And there's kind of no excuse for it because we have perfect weather. We could all be riding bikes. We don't even need an electric car um, for the majority of us. Uh, we, could, we could do it on bikes. We could walk. We could get out and get some fresh air. Um, so this is, this is going to act like a stimulus. And the, the fantastic thing, the, the thing that really, you know, we looked at all the different ways as a task force. How can we, as a task force, what should we be focusing on? We looked at sustainable tourism. We looked at, um, you know, beach cleanups and things like that. What, what is the way we're going to really have a big impact? And this program is fantastic. It, it almost seems magical to me. But if you look at how it works, you'll say, oh, OK, I get it. This makes sense. Why aren't we doing this already? Um, because the majority of Hawaii's households will get more money back from this program than any increased costs in things related to fossil fuels. And that is because of this really boring looking slide. And what this shows you is that on an annual basis, the highest 20% of Hawaii residents by income spent $20 billion, over $20 billion on oil, electricity, and natural gas. And the lowest 20% spent four and a half billion. The second, 6.6, .6, and the third, 8.6. If you add those three together, that's about the same. It's actually the highest 20% are spending more than the bottom 60%. This is really, this environmental issue is really a wealth gap issue is what it is. And so a lot of people will say, oh, the wealthy can afford uh, electric cars. They can afford solar panels in their house. So they're not spending as much on uh, oil. And it's just not true. It's, it's the opposite of the truth. And so what happens is if you go back to that, if you apply a level tax on or a level fee or whatever you want to call it on the fossil fuels as they come in, who's, who's going to be paying the most of that? Obviously, the highest 20% are going to be paying as much as the bottom 60% are combined. And so then if you take that money and you turn around and you give it out, even if you give it out evenly and, and give it out to all residents, even though the, 
the highest 20% don't really need a thousand dollar check. You could give it to them and you'd still get this result where 99% of low income families would see a financial gain. And we're talking, you know, five, $600 a year for the, the level of increase of price that we were looking at. And that's not a lot to some people, but to the lowest 20%, five to $600 in a year, or as it continues to go up, it goes up even to $1,000 per year. That is huge for them. That makes a huge difference to them. And you see the financial benefit still continues as you go up through the bottom 60% here. So once again, the, the vast majority of Hawaii's residents will benefit. And then even the upper middle class here does better on average. Only the, the wealthiest have to pay more into the program than they're getting out. And the thing is, they're not really relative to their income. It's not that significant to them anyways. They're, they're looking at a, a couple thousand dollars a year extra they're paying out. But if you're making, you know, three or four hundred thousand dollars, then that does not have as much of an impact as it does is giving that money back to the least wealthy um, residents. So there's lots of different ways we can talk about moving the money around and shifting the money around. But the really important thing about this that really grabbed my attention was that this is a, a wealth distribution issue more than a climate issue. This is a problem because of the huge wealth gap we have. And this program is a way to help both the environment and that wealth gap issue all at once. It's like, why aren't we doing this already? <laughs> So we ran some numbers just for fun, like, well, not for fun, it's, it's really important. Like if, you know, people were questioning, if someone has a really long drive, they drive from Waianae, they're driving in, we did this with a, a truck um, that gets like 20 miles per gallon. And we found that even if they commute every day from Waianae, they should still have a slight gain, which just shows you how much more oil, electricity, and gas that the wealthiest are using um, that somebody can commute to Y9 back every day of the week and still get a slight gain. Um, but the, the great thing about this is that if that resident who's getting a slight gain says, hey, you know what, if, if I decide to carpool, if I can figure out a way to carpool, you're going to save a lot of money. Um, and that's what this program does is it raises the prices a little bit slowly and gradually to nudge people to change, but gives the money back to the people so that they can choose. They can have the choice. Do I want to keep doing the same thing I've always done, driving my truck all the way back and forth? Or is there a way I can change my behavior and keep even more money? So, um, and, and obviously if you ride the bus, um, you save thousands. You actually save a lot a lot more than that. If you don't own a car at all, um, the typical expense for owning a car, say like a 2015 Honda Accord is around, um, if you include all the expenses, depreciation, insurance, um, all the random maintenance and things, gas, it comes out to about $5,000 a year people are spending by owning a car. Um, so, we're trying to encourage people to make changes in their life while not punishing them because we're gonna give the money back. We're just, it's the carrot versus the stick, right? Um, it's a little bit of carrot and stick, but I think it's more carrot. Um, so this is just kind of so, a summary. No, it's a summary. I'm just saying we try to do a hard stop at seven. I should have let you know. Yeah, yeah this is a summary. Okay. Um, so I'll just skip this. Um, we were looking at around you know, at a start, we're talking about maybe 10 cents per gallon increase in gasoline would be the impact. It's not the end of the world. Our gasoline prices are still less than they were 10 years ago. So, oh, seven o'clock, dang. I wanted to open it up to questions, but I'll just stop here. Okay. Um, thank you. I, I, I think I, yeah, I wish I, I could have been more strict on your your timing, and uh, but we do try to accommodate 
everyone else's schedules in the evening. People do rely on us to kind of try to finish on time. So um, Matt, thank you for that presentation. There were some questions. One question was where the, where the information, where the statistics came from. I, I saw you cited a study at the beginning that was done um, on that first slide. Um, but uh, if the slide, if you could make the slide show available, if you could send it to me as a PDF, I'll post it along with this Pauhana and then people can take a look because I saw the, the study was cited there uh, to the person who had the question. So let's all say thank you, Matt. I'm gonna turn off the, uh, the spotlights here and we can go to full, full group. I suppose, uh, yeah, so thank you for this. I'm gonna stop the official recording. So thank you everyone.